What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review the season one finale of The Last of Us, an episode called Look for the Light, written by the show's co-creators Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann, and directed by Ali Abbasi. And I know the Oscars are going on right now, but to hell with the Oscars. I wanted to watch this TV show because it's been quite a ride. We've had ups and downs in terms of quality and which episodes are stronger than others, but I've got one pretty major complaint about this episode, but on the whole, very satisfactory conclusion to an excellent season of television. So I should offer a spoiler warning. I will obviously be discussing what happened in the episode, as well as one of the major key differences between the show and the game. So if you're planning on playing the game, this is your only spoiler warning. But first and foremost, only 43 minutes long. I mean... It's like cruel and unusual punishment. I wanted like a 90-minute season finale because I might as well just jump ahead to my, my complaint. In the game, prior to getting picked up by the Fireflies in Salt Lake City, there's this giant epic battle in the tunnels beneath Salt Lake City where we get to see Joel and Ellie working as a team, taking on bloaters and clickers, etc. Basically, a total army of the infected. And I know that would have cost tons of money to shoot but it would have been just an additional money shot for the episode on top of that incredible sequence where Joel just goes on a murderous rampage in order to save Ellie but I'm getting ahead of myself let me slow down and take things one step at a time so let's just start with whether or not I like this season finale I did I didn't think it was the strongest episode of the season but it was good enough where I can kind of walk away from the show with a smile on my face feeling like they more or less stuck the landing and I will be looking forward to season two no matter what they decide to do with that potential adaptation. There's going to be a lot of debate about whether or not they should adhere to the second game the same way they had with the first game or if they should you know expand it into more seasons or make changes but the reality is the second game has sold over 10 million units to date. It was a successful game so my recommendation is that they just adapt the second game the exact same way they did the first game. One game, one season, I always defer to doing the most faithful adaptation possible. And if the second season kicks up a firestorm of controversy, so what? Unless they're planning on trying to extend the franchise beyond the second game, I feel like HBO can just ride out whatever controversy might be coming their way. But let's start with uh, where this episode began with the original OG Ellie, Ashley Johnson herself, pregnant, running away from, uh, looks like a runner or a stalker, not a full-blown clicker yet but we get a nice little origin story of Ellie's birth where we see the pregnant mother running for her life and then fighting for her life all while trying to give birth. And if not for this scene, there would be none of the infected in the episode at all. So I think it was very wise to include this because I think a big recurring complaint that a lot of people are going to have about this final episode is where the hell are the infected? Like, Give us at least one major send-off with the infected. But I guess it was episode six that was the big send-off with that bloater and that huge invading army in uh, Kansas City. But Ashley Johnson, I feel like over the last 10, 15 years, has been quietly accumulating this really impressive career. My favorite stuff she does is with Matt Mercer and his team over with uh, Critical Role and their animated show, The Legend of Vox Machina. But there are a lot of people who think that she did almost too good a job with Ellie, making it virtually impossible for Bella Ramsey to follow in her footsteps. At any rate, having her in this episode was a great way to kind of tip the hat to the original actors who portrayed these characters. And I thought it was a really moving scene where she lies to Marlene and says, I got bitten after I cut the umbilical cord. We, the audience, know that is not the case, which would obviously lead to, many years later, Ellie developing an immunity. Because I guess if they wanted to try to develop a cure for everybody, everybody needs to find a way to be born where their parents are being attacked all at once. Obviously, the timing on that might be a little tricky, but we see how she passes down her knife to Marlene and asks her to accept the responsibility of looking after her baby, as well as killing her then and there. And then the rest of the episode rips through the remaining story in record time, including a lot of great lines and scenes directly from the game, like when Joel offers to teach Ellie how to play guitar, which will pay huge, <clears throat> which will pay huge emotional dividends in the second season. But we see how Ellie is really quiet, really distant, really spaced out. And obviously she's got a lot of mixed feelings about coming to the end of this journey. And she's also wrestling with survivor's guilt. I mean, as she explains at the end, between the death of Riley and Tess and just everybody they've met along the way, 
when you're one of the only survivors after, after, after everybody's met these horrible, cruel fates, it's got to leave you feeling a little ambivalent about things. But before all the bloodshed, murder, and mayhem, we do get a few really sweet, heartfelt scenes. We get the famous giraffe scene from the game where... I don't know what would happen if the infected encountered or got access to all those giraffes on the loose. Also, I don't know how all those giraffes are surviving the winters in uh, Salt Lake City because Salt Lake City gets cold as hell in the winter and giraffes obviously originate from a very hot climate. At any rate, it's great to see Ellie just getting to enjoy being a kid again as she's feeding this giraffe and the big tongue comes out. And there's a really moving scene where Joel admits that he tried shooting himself two days after the outbreak but that he flinched at the last second and so he survived his suicide attempt and when she implies that perhaps time heals all wounds, he says, no, time didn't do it. But the implication is their relationship is what, is what has allowed him to heal eventually. And I thought that was um, just a very tender moment between these two characters. And then the scene that we should have seen was this absolute balls through the wall tunnel sequence. And I recommend everybody go on YouTube, just look at The Last of Us 2013 final chapter, or just look for like tunnel run, hardcore mode, whatever. But a ton of people have uh, posted video of themselves blasting their way through that tunnel where they're fighting multiple bloaters and multiple clickers all at once. And it is just, it's insane. It's really hardcore. And even if you're not playing the game, it's riveting to watch. It's just so goddamn gruesome. But as I mentioned before, what I really like about it is that we see how Joel and Ellie now are almost like Batman and Robin, where like they're this really elite fighting force working in tandem, to, in tandem together. And I feel like... It was a mistake to leave it out, and HBO should have thrown down the cash. And clearly, there's plenty of room in the episode. They could have included a five to ten minute action sequence in this episode, but obviously, it would have been very expensive. But finally, they get ambushed by their fireflies, and from that point on, the show pretty much unfolds almost identical to the game, except for a few minor differences. And I imagine that for people who have not seen those cutscenes, that it was quite a shock because. When Joel comes to, Marlene's there, and she says that Ellie is already being prepped for surgery, and that they believe they finally found a cure that can save the entire planet. And when she says that she has no choice in the matter, there's this incredible moment where Joel just says, I do. And the way Pedro Pascal delivers that line, you're like, oh my God, this guy, he's about to get real bloody, and they have no idea what they're in store for, but... Yeah, Pedro Pascal, he's done a great job with this character. And for everybody who's been waiting to see Pedro Pascal really cut loose and commit some serious acts of violence, I hope they were satisfied by the shooting spree that he goes on in the action climax to this episode. I guess my only complaints about the action scene, I have two, and where they differ slightly from the game. When Joel first makes his move from the guy uh, escorting him out, in the game, he starts asking them questions, and when the guy tries to avoid answering the questions, Joel starts repeatedly shooting him in the stomach, and it's just so ruthless and so hardcore. It's even more hardcore than the torture scene in the previous episode, and when the guy finally gives him the answers he's looking for, Joel just executes him. So I wish that scene had made it intact into the show. And also, when Joel finally finds Ellie, I guess in the game you have the option to, like, to what degree you want to massacre everybody in the room or not. And in the show, obviously, they just chose to have him kill the doctor. But in the game, or at least the playthroughs that I've watched on YouTube, usually the player kills everybody in the room before scooping up Ellie and making it out of there. So I feel like the show tapped the brakes a little bit when it came to the intensity of that scene. But all the action that unfolded prior to that, it was all choreographed in expert fashion. But it made me wonder as I was watching it, how did Joel get so good at like guerrilla warfare or like urban urban warfare and urban combat when all these fireflies have clearly like they've not received the training that Joel has, or they're just not um, they're not like you know surging with that sense of purpose that Joel has? Because at this point he's clearly racing to save the life of a girl that in many ways has become his daughter. But one area where this show did not tap the brakes was with the confrontation with Marlene, which unfolded almost shot for shot like in the game, including the little jump cuts where he's talking to Marlene, then they cut ahead to where they're in the car, Ellie comes to and she's like, what happened? Like, where are my clothes? And he's basically saying, oh, you know, they've got dozens of other people, they've stopped looking for a cure, Raiders attacked, we barely got out of there, just telling her some really thin lies, but she's on a bunch of drugs and she's kind of half listening. But as they're driving along, then it cuts back to how Joel shot Marlene, put Ellie in the car, came back, and as Marlene's, you know, begging to live, he says, you just come after her. Boom. Shot to the head. I mean, for all the ways that this show tapped the brakes on the earlier violence, oh my God, like they leaned all the way in on that particular moment. I thought it was pretty brutal and pretty intense. 
And as far as the final scene goes, I have to say I love the creative decision to end it on a on a, a moment of mystery or ambivalence where we don't quite know if Ellie is accepting the lie that Joel has chosen to tell her where she confronts him and says, look, please tell me or swear that everything you've told me about the fireflies is true. And he says, I swear. And she says, okay. Then you cut to credits. And so we're left wondering, like, does she believe him? Does she want to believe him? Does she kind of half believe him? And I guess the big philosophical question for audiences, for the audience is, like, did Joel make a mistake in thinking about his own needs as a surrogate parent of this girl when part of him probably knows that Ellie would have chosen to sacrifice her life if she thought there was at least a chance that she might save all of humanity? And I feel like all these questions about whether or not what he did was right or wrong and whether or not she would have agreed with this decision, it just ends the whole saga on this incredible, I guess, on a point where where we can debate endlessly whether or not Joel made the right decision, whether or not he made a decision solely for him as opposed to for her, would she have wanted him to do the same? Like, who knows? It, I guess this open-ended um, nature of the ending is going to invite a lot of comparisons, I think, to the ending of The Godfather. And I'm not saying that the game or the show and The Godfather are like something that should be necessarily compared, but the ending of The Godfather has that famous moment where Michael Corleone lies to his wife and says that he did not have his brother-in-law murdered. But it ended the movie in such devastating fashion where people can debate what kind of transformation Michael Corleone has gone through. I mean, there are people still talking about that ending more than 50 years later, so it makes me want to circle back to some of the comments that I've made about this show and this game that I've been making all season where finally we've, had, we've found storytellers and filmmakers who have recognized the incredible cinematic potential of certain video games where the history of video game adaptations is so terrible and there have been so many awful shows and awful movies. And I know some people are going to talk about Arcane or they're going to talk about Castlevania, but if you compare the number of good video game adaptations to the number of bad ones, it's like one versus a thousand. But here we are 10 years after the release of the original game, which has been massively influential with many other games and with many of the other game developers out there. And I think this show is going to be massively influential. It would not surprise me at all if in two to three years' time we're going to see some shows and movies based on games where their ambition and their creativity and just their overall vision for the material is dramatically superior to anything that we've seen before because The Last of Us has shown us that there's real storytelling potential in these games. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if we see a similar phenomenon that we saw in the early 2000s where suddenly... Between the Lord of the Rings adaptation and the Harry Potter adaptations and the sudden eruption of superhero movies, it suddenly seemed like all these books and comics that have been really popular for like the last 20, 30, 40 years, that they were all fair game for big budget adaptations. And suddenly Hollywood realized, oh, like all these nerds that have been screaming about this stuff for all these years, maybe there's something to all these stories. And I think we're finally going to see a similar thing now with video game adaptations where I think we're going to see fewer comic book adaptations and a hell of a lot more video game adaptations, but we'll have to wait a few years before we know if my prediction is going to come true. But I think that's all I've got to say about The Last of Us. It's been a hell of a ride, and if you've been watching my videos since the season one premiere, thank you so much for the support throughout the season, and I'll be back to tackling HBO content in two weeks with the final season of succession. But before I wrap things up, I do need to bring you a public service announcement because Manscaped now has beard products and now a brand new nose and ear hair trimmer. If you haven't already heard, the leaders in below the waist grooming are traveling north of your South Pole with their revolutionary Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Plus, they've now launched the brand new Weed Whacker 2.0, which confirms they have all the best tools for your hygiene toolbox. Time for you to upgrade your toolbox by going to manscaped.com and using the discount code WRONGREAL in all caps for 20% off plus free shipping. I'll include a link down in the description below. But the Beard Hedger Pro Kit is the ultimate package that makes it easier than ever to craft your signature look. This thing is an elite beard trimmer. The Beard Hedger is tough on hair but smooth on your face, leading to single stroke efficiency that brings satisfaction one stroke at a time. And with a nice beard, your face is perfectly groomed, right? Wrong. You need to keep an eye out for those tough to trim ear and nose hairs. The brand new Weed Whacker 2.0 offers improved blades and skin safe technology with a no tugging guarantee. It's never been so painless to mind your manholes. So if you like this channel or you like my podcast, Wrong Reel, 
please consider making a purchase over at Manscaped using the discount code WRONGREAL. But thank you so much for watching my rants and raves and, or ravings over the course of this season. If you've enjoyed them, please consider subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, liking the video, all that good stuff, and hunting me down on Twitter at Geeking Out. But hope everyone has a great week, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.